Delphine Brandt was born and raised in France. She met her husband, Doug, when he was there playing professional basketball. They got married and moved to the United States. When they had their first daughter, Leona, one of the biggest cultural differences she noticed with American parenting was, not surprisingly, the food. My mother-in-law came to visit one time, and I think it was, Leona was past a year old, and, and she made a peanut butter and jelly for lunch. Uh-huh. And I about lost it. Not to my mother-in-law, but to my husband. I think I grabbed him and we went into the bedroom and I said, over my dead body, my children will not eat peanut butter. I thought it was just the most disgusting fast food. <laughs> <laughs> and and now I've, I'm sending Uncrustable every day for lunch. <laughs> you just change. But yes, there's foods. There were some foods that in my French mind were absolutely unacceptable. They were snacks. This is the How She Moms podcast, where we talk about how different moms solve the same problems. I'm Whitney Archibald, a mother of five kids myself. I collect ideas so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. Today, we're going to talk about a common parenting battleground, kids and food. Most of us haven't been in a sitcom style, hurl mashed potatoes across the room kind of food fight, though I do have a friend who stages a family food fight in her backyard every year. But many of us engage in some sort of food-related skirmish on a daily basis. There are so many potential conflicts here, from picky eating to table manners. The goal of this two-part series is to help you at least to neutralize these battles, but preferably to go even further and actually make eating with your kids a positive experience, with a lot of great ideas from moms on the front lines. We're going to talk about four of the biggest food battles we have with kids over the next two episodes. In this episode, part one, we'll talk about two potential battles, picky eating and house rules about what types of food you eat. In part two, we'll talk about battles over when kids eat, especially snacks, and how kids eat, how they act at the table. Perhaps the biggest battle we have with our kids is getting them to eat what we make for them. It's so frustrating to spend time cooking a meal and then to have your kid utterly refuse to eat it or just push it around on their plate. When this happens, there are lots of ways for you, the mom, to respond. On one end of the spectrum, you can make your kid sit at the table until he finishes everything on his plate, like many of our parents or grandparents did. One of the stories in my family lore is when my grandpa, who was ironically super picky himself, threatened to put a green bean up my aunt's nose if she wouldn't eat it. This is a surefire way to make your dinner table a battlefield. The other end of the spectrum is becoming a short order cook catering to everyone's preferences and cooking several different things each meal. This might be the most peaceful solution, but it's an awful lot of work for the cook and is usually not very healthy for the kids either. Luckily, many of the moms I talked to had great ideas for avoiding both of these extreme scenarios. As is usually the case, the first thing to do when dealing with a picky eater is to figure out what's behind it. This gets into a tricky nature versus nurture debate. Some people, especially in our parents' generation, believe that it's mostly a nurture issue that if we'd stop catering to their whims, our children wouldn't be so picky and entitled. And there's often some truth to this, but there's also often a biological element at play too. My friend Reba Martin has two sons with sensory issues, so getting them to eat anything has been a major struggle. For years, she kept a list of the few foods they would actually eat. We're talking four to six things total, and celebrated each time they added another thing to their lists. Food therapy and time have improved the situation, but it's been very challenging. For some kids, anxiety can play a role as well. For others, it's a control issue. One of my kids definitely uses food as a manipulative tool. When he's in a certain mood, he'll just refuse to eat. He knows I want him to eat, so there's no way he's going to let me win. Once I learned not to make a big deal out of his hunger strike and just let him be hungry if he so chooses, he dropped the act and started eating like a human being again. You might even be able to blame it on your kid's tongue. Apparently, about 25% of the population are considered super tasters, whose tongues are extra sensitive to bitter flavors. For many people in this category, foods like broccoli and Brussels sprouts are too unpleasant for them to handle. There's also a subset of people for whom cilantro tastes distinctly like soap. So crazy. Luckily for most kids, pickiness is just a temporary stage. The very first episode of one of my favorite podcasts, What Fresh Hell, was about picky eating, and it's such a great one. Margaret Abels and Amy Wilson are both funny and wise, a great combination. They both have kids who are extremely picky eaters, although the good news is that Amy's son has grown out of it, as is usually the case. 
Listening to this episode is the first time I had heard this theory about why most toddlers go through a picky stage. Picky eating at 18 months to three years becomes a biological imperative. When kids become mobile, they become picky eaters because they need to be able to survive in the wild. That's right. I read that. Then it's, yes. a, it's, it's, it's built in. It's innate that they weren't supposed right. to eat every berry off every bush. That's right. Because if in the wild, if your child is an experimental eater, they're going to kill themselves eating berries and weird things. And so everybody says, oh, my kid ate everything until they were two. But there's a reason that happens. So oh. that... Like everybody stopped feeling bad about that. That's a really good point. And I, and I wish I knew that then. a biological imperative. Once your kid gains mobility, their tastes become more restrictive. And yes, annoying super mom who's like, but that never happened to my kid. Like, fine. Your kid would have died, died in the wild. However, picky eating can also be influenced by culture. When Delphine's first daughter was young, they would spend two months at a time in France visiting family. Here's Delphine. So Leona ate everything, tried everything, would actually gain weight in France so much. She would eat so much. She loved everything. And we would come back to the U.S. and she became this picky eater. It was difficult. I would have to say that in France, there's a culture of food that it's really easy to just make your kids not picky eaters and not snackers because everybody is on board. Whether you take them to daycare whether you take them to preschool and school and they eat their lunch there, everybody has the same idea of what a, a, a very well-balanced meal is in general. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you have to fight with the teachers, like, no, they shouldn't have goldfish for a snack. How about you give them a sliced apple? Because the teacher is already thinking that way. So I can see how it is much an easier task for French mom to stick with a good diet we, we don't tell our kids don't eat sugars because we feed them fruits. And sugar and fruits are the good sugar to have. You can't go wrong with fruits. Um, there's, there's just a, a general, I would say, a general approach to, to food and friends. Everybody around your kid is not going to let them snack. Or, and snacks are incorporated in the normal meal plan. I first clued into the French method of food education after reading the book Bringing Up Bebe by Pamela Druckerman, an American mom who wrote about what she learned about French parenting while raising a baby in France. The section about food was so fascinating, I had to learn more. So I found the book French Kids Eat Everything by Karen Lebillon, a Canadian mom who married a French guy and lived in France for a couple of years while their kids were young. This book has revolutionized the way I think about feeding kids. In the first place, I never thought about the idea of actually teaching kids how to eat. But in France, it's not only something parents think about, but it's even part of their formal education. Starting in nursery school, kids eat surprisingly varied and delicious meals at school with several courses, including an entree, a main course, a salad, a cheese, and a dessert, which is often a fruit. They don't bring their own lunches, and they don't choose between several different foods. They all eat the same delicious food together. She says, Many North American parents believe that kids don't like vegetables. We assume that kids don't like spicy foods, flavorful foods, colorful foods, textured foods, strange-looking foods, or new foods. Basically, we believe that kids don't like real food. And we also take it for granted that what kids do like is restricted to an extremely short list topped by things like pasta, chips, and crackers. But what if we were to believe the opposite? French parents believe that their children will grow up to eat like they do, to enjoy tasting new foods, to choose a balanced diet, to eat their vegetables uncomplainingly, and to enjoy food, all food, in moderation. French parents and teachers encourage children every step of the way, believing that the children will turn out to be healthy eaters. When Karen moved to France, her oldest was definitely a picky eater, and she did not think eating at preschool would ever work for her. Beet salad? Yeah, right. But soon enough, she was eating quiche and beet salad with the rest of the kids. Here are some of Karen's tips for picky eaters. Children shouldn't be forced to eat, or even worse, to clean their plates, but simply to taste the things they are served. Taste this, you'll like it, works better than eat this, it's good for you. If your children don't like something, encourage them to believe that they eventually will. Oh, you don't like it, I'll say to my children? That's okay. You just haven't tasted it enough times yet. You'll like it when you grow up. Try an indirect, low-pressure way of offering a new food. Place a little plate with a small portion of the new food on the table, near but not directly in front of your child. Taste a piece or two with clear enjoyment, then leave it. Chances are your child will pick up a piece and try it. And finally, try simple textures. 
We often introduce new foods and purees or soup, even for our older daughter. Children get used to the taste and can then move on to the real texture of the food. Over and over, Karen reiterates that the biggest reason French kids are less picky is that eating together is an enjoyable experience, far from a battlefield. Two pieces of advice that I've heard over and over while researching this topic, and that can sometimes be at odds with one another, is, first, that a parent should be in charge of providing the food and kids should be in charge of deciding what to eat, and second, that kids often need to try a food at least 12 times before they like it. You're going to have to feel your own kids out on where to stand on these two rules. Margaret from What Fresh Hell has a good perspective on this. Again, in the rule books, like you're never supposed to tell them what they're supposed to eat. Everybody but says, but if you like, didn't, then he would eat only crescent he rolls. Would I mean, eat six crescent rolls for dinner every single night and nothing else. And you can't let that happen. I know that from from what I've learned about my own um, parenting an anxious child. So here's one great way Margaret has helped expand her son's food repertoire. We started something last year, again, around um, Anxious Eater, uh, where every Wednesday we try a new food. And it's funny because even my super anxious, scared um, kid who doesn't like to try things, if I serve something normal on Wednesday, he's like, but it's new food Wednesday. Why aren't we trying a new food? Because he just got excited by the idea of new food Wednesday. And then I'll serve lasagna and he'll be miserable the entire time, occasionally in tears. And then the next day he'll go to school and say, oh, we tried lasagna last night for New Food Wednesday. It was great. <laughs> so bizarre. It's it's marketing. You know, they, it's I, all marketing. I got my picky eater when he was about four to start eating. But to eating be clear, he does not eat lasagna. Like he does not eat lasagna. Except if it's New Food Wednesday, then he'll. But he, does, he even then, like he barely tastes it. So it's not quite working, but there's something about it that's working. Molly Liggett's kids live by the rule. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. They eat whatever is for dinner. They don't have to finish it, but they don't get anything else after dinner if they don't eat. They're just hungry until breakfast. If they want seconds of something, they have to eat their veggies and protein. This works for them because the kids rarely, if ever, actually go to bed hungry, especially since they're always allowed to eat fruits and veggies. I also know from experience that both Molly and her husband are great cooks, and dinner is generally a pretty pleasant experience at their house. But Molly has six kids and certainly can't cater to all of their preferences. Sarah Engebretson always tries to have at least one safe food that everyone likes to eat, like rice or quinoa, so that even if kids refuse some things, they'll have something to eat. My neighbor Van Oberly asks her kids to take a thank you bite, a taste to show that they appreciate whoever made the food. My husband and I really enjoy trying new foods and being adventurous eaters, so it's a culture we've encouraged with our kids, too. We often repeat the motto, Archibald's try new things, and we try to make it seem like the cool thing to do. When they were little, we'd encourage them to try a new food by putting it on their fork and chanting, Dominate! Dominate! until they put it in their mouth and we'd all cheer. Then we'd heap lots of praise on them for being adventurous, even if they didn't like it. Another way I used to get little ones to eat their food was inspired by the show Yo Gabba Gabba. There's a sketch where all the little cartoon food goes to a party in the characters' tummies. So I'd pretend the food was talking and wanted to go to the party in their tummy, and I'd make sounds of glee as the food slid down the slide to the party. It was sometimes a bit exhausting, I'm not going to lie, but usually when they ask for the tiny voice, I give in and play along. It was very motivating for them. <laughs> there are also some great picture books out there to help create a culture of more adventurous eating. The most obvious one is Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss, which I'm just going to assume you're all familiar with. Another one my kids love is called Little Pea by Amy Rosenthal, in which a little anthropomorphic pea must eat all his candy before he can eat spinach for dessert. Yes, this reinforces the whole clean your plate strategy, but in a funny way. The next one, one of my favorites, is Bread and Jam for Francis by Russell and Lillian Hoban. I love the Francis books. That mother badger is just so wise, and Francis makes up the most delightful little songs. In this one, Francis refuses to eat anything but bread and jam, so her mom stops offering anything else, eliminating the battle. Soon, Francis starts feeling left out of all the delicious meals and starts branching out. I'm sure there are several more books in this vein, but the last one I'll mention is I Will Never Not Ever Eat a Tomato by Lauren Child. You have to say tomato like that because it's a Charlie and Lola book, and of course that's how they say it. We love Charlie and Lola at our house, partly because it's both witty and sweet, but also because when my kids watch the cartoon, they start talking in a British accent all the time, and everything they say just sounds so much more polite. Anyway, in the book, Charlie convinces Lola to eat her veggies with the fun game of pretend. Who hasn't cajoled kids into eating broccoli trees? 
I'll include this list of books in my show notes and also in this week's email. Now that they're older, one of our favorite ways to encourage them to try new foods is an idea I got from Anna McFarlane from Kids Are the Worst and Anna is the Worst. She makes a charcuterie board after church each Sunday and calls it charcuterie. We started doing this and the kids love it. Our twist is that we try to have something new for the kids to try on the board each week, and we again heap the praise on those who are brave enough to try it. Now that they're getting more adventurous, we try to include kind of weird foods like sardines, spicy pickles and peppers, and strong cheeses, but we've definitely worked up to that. There's also the tactic of peer pressure. I love it when my kids see friends or cousins heartily enjoying a food they've decided that they don't like. Especially if I don't make a big deal out of it, they're more likely to give something a try if they see someone they really like eating it. Several people mentioned the benefits of sleepaway camp for using peer pressure to expand their kids' food repertoire as well. All of these tactics have worked great for our family, but I still have one who won't eat eggs and yogurt, one who won't drink milk, and one who doesn't like pasta, at least for now. It's also good to remember that you don't have to have the same rules in every situation. Kristen Steele has decided that she really doesn't care what her kids eat or don't eat away from home. She says, I want to enjoy my meal when we are guests in someone else's home, or when we are traveling or eating in a restaurant, so I just let my kids go when we aren't eating at home. I have the opposite problem. In fact, I wouldn't fault my in-laws if they called Child Protective Services on me. Every time we eat there, my kids scarf down the food and say things like, Oh, I never get full unless I'm at your house. (laughs) They act like I've never fed them before. Sigh. Valeria Miller's advice is just to stop stressing out about it so much. Her pediatrician gave her great advice when her two girls were babies, to think of their food balance variety in terms of a full week and not to try to make sure every meal is perfectly balanced. Above all, it's so important that we don't label our kids as picky eaters and make that a part of their identity. Amy Wilson of the What Fresh Hell podcast has experience with that either people decided ahead of time he wouldn't eat something because he doesn't eat things like that set in front of him or you don't want to be a picky eater like your older brother your cousin you're not a picky eater like him so I'm going to see you finish this and I think like we you can't allow the sort of larger world to reinforce the narrative that that's who your kid is I'm going to take a little break to remind you that I'll be offering my meal planning workshop free until the end of May and then it will cost $25 again I'm hoping that the workshop will bring some fresh ideas to family dinner while we're still all cooking so much at home during this pandemic. In the workshop, I present several different approaches to meal planning from several different moms so you can find a system that works for you, even if you're usually not big on systems. You can sign up for the course at HowSheMoms.com. I'm also busy working on a workshop about laundry, so stay tuned for that. Another common fight we often have with our kids is about what they are and are not allowed to eat at any given time. This is such a tricky line to walk. We want them to learn healthy habits, but we don't want to be too restrictive or controlling. I, for one, seem like I'm always going back and forth about how many treats they should get or how strict to be about eating their vegetables. So right at the beginning of this section, I want to set you at ease with this perspective from my good friend Jen Brewer, a dietitian and mom of seven. I feel like as moms, a lot of times we're too hard on ourselves because I feel like things will even out through lifespans. Sometimes I feel like I'm giving the worst habits with my kids in whatever realm of life. Right. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna be that roommate. But I, one example is I had a friend who her mom was how do I say this nicely? Incredibly controlling of every single thing they ate. Uh-huh. Like no sugar in their house whatsoever. And this was even before that was a cool fad. Like nothing. And my house was the opposite. So she would always come to my house and just go crazy because it just was nowhere to be found. She's grown up, she's a mom, and she's okay. She went through a time, admittedly, she said, where when she went to college, she just kind of went crazy. She gained quite a bit of weight and struggled for a few years, but then kind of came back and, and normalized and has healthy habits, has great kids. So I think either extreme you go, Yes, it's great to give our kids a boost in life and to, to, we absolutely want to try to do the right things. And as much as we feel like we're messing our kids up, nah, they're going to be okay in the long run. They're going to come around. (laughs) Guilt and pressure about what to feed our kids starts right at the beginning with choices about breast over bottle. I'm not going to go into that here because that's an episode in and of itself. But then we start solid foods and it gets confusing right away and the rules keep changing When my first son was a baby, we were supposed to wait until he was a year old to try peanut butter. 
Now we're supposed to introduce it at around six months with a wide variety of other healthy foods. When you go back farther in history, it's even more confusing. I'll defer to my friends Diane Aragona and Jen Tierney over at the podcast, Our Parents Did What, to give us a little history lesson. Prior to the 1880s, they really just fed babies either um, wheat gruel or like beef broth. Excellent. <laughs> Basically like very, what they thought were like iron rich foods that mm -hmm. would, um, would fortify you, that would make you strong, they thought. Um, so nothing really nutritional. They actually, um, they didn't want to give babies vegetables and fruits at all because they, they didn't know much about vitamins and minerals yet, but also because it's a natural laxative and they were actually worried about that. They were like, no, no, no. We don't want our babies to be pooping a lot, so we're not <laughs> going to give them fruits and vegetables. We are only going to give them wheat gruel. Oh, my goodness. Then, in the early 1900s, Harold Clapp made a vegetable broth for his sick son. One thing led to another, and baby food was born. By World War II, the baby food craze got a little out of hand. Breastfeeding went out of fashion for a while, including with my own grandmother, who claimed she had nervous milk. So uh, mothers started to really feed their babies um, baby food instead to show their wealth, to show their status, and to get away from the breastfeeding. So are you ready for this craziness? Yes. I'm going to hit you with something insane. Okay. <laughs> How young do you think they started feeding babies baby food after World War II when it got really popular? Uh, maybe like two months? You're close. Okay. A little earlier than that. Six weeks. Six weeks. Whew. Oh. Six weeks. Yes. <laughs> they were recommending that you start giving your baby baby food yeah. and like not necessarily cut out formula, but, you know, not really give as much of that. Really give your child fruits and vegetables starting at six weeks old. Wow. The rest of the episode traces the history of baby food to the present day and is clearly a really fun and fascinating listen. I'll link to it, of course. If you haven't listened to Our Parents Did What, it's always a fascinating look into the history of parenting. Another great podcast I found while researching for this episode is called Didn't I Just Feed You? The hosts, Stacey Billis and Megan Splon, are both food professionals and moms, and it's such a down-to-earth, non-judgmental podcast about feeding families. In their first season, they did a fabulous three-part series about sugar, which I highly recommend. The first of those, hyperbolically called The Beast Hiding in Your Pantry, took a really balanced view of how to approach treats with kids. Here's Megan. My kids are really young, and I don't want them to think that any food is good or bad. Yes. Food is food. Like, let's take labels off of it, and let's talk about how certain foods maybe make you feel if you eat too many of too much of them. I mean, you can get an upset belly from eating too much broccoli. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, you can. I'm just saying, like, in defense of <laughs> JoJo's. Uh, <laughs> so I just try to be really careful about, like, saying, oh, we can't have that because that's a sometimes food or that's not like a good choice right now. And so I think I am pretty lenient when it comes to sugar in our house. What I do pay a lot of attention to and probably like in an obnoxious to my husband and probably my children in a way is like added sugar and things. So yes, we do keep like applesauce pouches on hand because the kids can help themselves to those for snacks and they feel like a decent choice. But you have to be really careful because those pouches can be full of added sugar or like sweetened with fruit juice that is just added sugar. So that like that and like even snack crackers, you have to be really mindful of the added totally. sugar. Cereal, of course, is one that we've kind of talked about before where it can have a, a lot of added sugar if you're not careful. Jen Brewer has a good perspective on this as well. We don't have any foods off the table. We don't have Oreos at eight o'clock in the morning, but there's no food that is strictly, this is a bad food. You can't eat this. What we talk to our kids a lot about is this is this food is healthy for your body and this food is a treat so we very much distinguish it's not good or bad it's no this food makes you strong this food helps your body be strong and I even go so far as to say this food helps your eyes mm -hmm. this food helps your muscles this food helps your blood just because of the vitamins and minerals and cookies this is a treat food so it's not that it's bad and you can't have it. It's no, this is a treat food. So we don't have that all day and we don't have treat foods in the morning. Let's wait until after lunch to have right. that is more instead of the good and bad. It's no, you want the healthy stuff, 
and then we can fit in the treat stuff. The idea that there are no bad foods is generally true, except when it's not. Kids with allergies and other dietary restrictions are a different story. I myself have celiac disease, and I've been gluten-free since I was about 11, so I understand food restrictions. It was especially difficult 30 years ago when there were few gluten-free products around besides rice cakes. My kids are all gluten-free as well, but I often tell my kids that our dietary restrictions are a great training ground for self-control with even the foods we can eat. I often tell my kids that if they can say no to a donut, it'll be pretty easy to say no to drugs. One of the most frustrating things about deciding what to feed your kids is that we don't always know what's best for them. It's always changing. Here's Megan again from the same episode of Didn't I Just Feed You. I used to chug orange juice like it was nothing, right? Because then juice was okay. Now the, you know, pediatric association is like, no, juice is terrible. <laughs> like, give your kids water only. Right? Like, right? We, And now there's a whole host of products like kids water in boxes because we've yep. demonized juice as a sh- source of sugar. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, this stuff changes all the time. It was like skim milk. Now it's like, oh my God, no, skim milk is just sugar water without any of the fat, the good fat, without any of the vitamins, minerals, all this stuff is taken out, you know? And like, I know this has nothing to do with sugar, but like coconut oil, it's a wonder food. Wait, are you kidding? No, like you're going to die early. (laughs) Coconut oil, too much coconut oil. Stop, people. (laughs) I mean, it's constantly changing. Things like eggs, butter, and red meat seem to constantly go in and out of fashion. How are we supposed to know what to feed our kids? Of course, we can always rely on food and vegetables as healthy choices, but even those are subject to fads. It seems like there's always an it vegetable from kale to celery to cauliflower. And some fruits are higher in sugar or fiber than others. Nutrition is a tricky science. But generally, we can count on those fruits and vegetables. Here are a few more tips for encouraging kids to eat them. Molly Liggett tries to serve veggies first while she finishes cooking. The kids are always hungry at that point, so they're more likely to eat the veggies while they wait for dinner than during dinner. Jen Brewer likes to associate vegetables with specific foods that the kids already like. For example, she always serves carrots on pizza night. On the rare occasion that she doesn't have carrots on pizza night, the kids ask, where are the carrots? Valeria Miller serves a bowl of fruit with every dinner because she knows it's something healthy at least one of her daughters will eat. She's still working on introducing more vegetables. She says, as a kid, I think I only ate potatoes and tomatoes, and that's about it. Now I eat lots of veggies and enjoy them, so I don't stress too much about it. Just keep offering what I make, and once in a while I force them to have a few bites of it. One French trick is to pass fruit off as a dessert. Here's Delphine. I try to implement a fruit after di- like right after dinner. I've been a big, like, you want a dessert? Let's have a fruit and let's tell your brain, this is it. I'm very satisfied. I have, I had this satisfying fruit or yogurt or something sweet. And then they don't reach for ice cream or they don't want 30 minutes later a bedtime snack. Because my husband is huge on bedtime snack. And I have to fight. He was born in 73, kids of the 80s. Uh Parents were not foodies. So ice cream for bedtime snack was not a problem. He's super skinny, never fought with weight issue. Um, and so for him, it was like, well, let's have a bedtime snack. Let's have an ice cream. And ice cream for me, it's a treat, and therefore it should be once a month. If you're good once a week, but not part of your daily um, food chart. It's nowhere on the food chart anyway, ice cream. And so some days I just let it go because our kids are – lucky enough to be pretty thin and not that I have a weight issue but I just don't want them to struggle I want them to be happy in their body and so I want them to eat everything they want but I want them to understand what they're putting in in their body might just create some issue later and I don't want them to have that I want them to be healthy all the way it's again it's not a weight issue I'm not a any French woman. <laughs> I just, I wanted the, the, the ice cream to be a treat, so a special treat, not that every day or every week. So I try to implement that, that fruit after dinner, like right after when they're done with their main course. I want them to have a yogurt or a fruit, and I swear that it does give your, your brain 
this like last little bite of satisfaction. Okay, you're you're done. Of course, different kids have different issues. My kids all love treats, but I've never had one so obsessed as my youngest. If I have any treats in the house, he sniffs them out and begs mercilessly for them. He can't think of anything else. Because of this, I've started just buying or making treats the day we're going to consume them. I asked Jen for her advice on this. I started with twins, and very, I think it was about when they were age four at, at trick-or-treating. I had one of the twins who she would not eat a single, a single piece of candy, and it would still be in her room at Easter. Now, her twin, from one house, he would rip it open, eat the candy, go to the next house, rip it open, eat the candy, go to the next house. Rip. So total opposite ends of the spectrum. And I, I did not do a lot of inf- intervention with him. Mostly it was, we did a lot of talking on listen to your belly. It wasn't so much evil. It was just, you're going to get a belly ache. You know, just talking in four, four-year-old language, you'll get a belly ache if you eat too much. But I wasn't overly aggressive with him. He's now 17 and he doesn't have any issues, doesn't hoard. So for him, it was a phase. He kind of grew out of it. I have another one in that bottomless treat pit who I have kind of thought, Ooh, this is, I think even a little bit more extreme. So with her, it's, we just talk about this will make your body sick if you eat too much. So let's save it until after lunch, but then let her have it after lunch and then say, okay, now we're going to save this until tomorrow but let her have it tomorrow. So she knows it's that she knows there's a future where she will get it and not the whole bowl where it's okay. You're, you're going to have a piece, but if, remember this is a treat, it's not healthy for your body and we want our bodies to be strong. And I have seen her now she'll bring something to me and she'll be like, this is healthy for my body. Isn't it mom? I think it's putting some boundaries on it, not making it lock and key. I, I think with kids, especially they need to know, that there will be a point that they can have it instead of the unknown. Jen and I also talked about how much we should feed our kids, a complicated issue. Here's what she had to say. The number one thing that I, that I feel like we can train our kids to do is stay in tune with their hunger cues and, and to label their appetite cues. If that makes sense. There are, there are several little things you can do. But in studies that they've done in American children, this was really sobering to me, is children, small children are amazing at turning their mouths off when their stomach is full. And the problem comes is when us as parents force that beyond their natural control. Interesting. And it starts as it starts as early as, oh, just finish. There's just two more ounces in this bottle. Just finish this bottle. Or there's just two more bites. Just finish this, finish these last few bites. Because in the study, pre, they, they studied preschool kids and then redid a study after kindergarten. And preschool kids they found were fantastic at monitoring when they were full. They would walk away from goldfish crackers. Huh. They would walk away from, quote unquote, the good food to kids and just be like, yeah, I'm done. Once those kids finish kindergarten, they no longer, they would always eat until it was gone. They huh. would have lost cue of their hunger and satiety. Libion talks about this in her book, too. She decided to try out the French custom of serving only one snack a day, which we'll talk about more in the next section about when kids eat. Her husband added to her new rule. In between meals, it's okay to feel hungry. At meals, eat until you're satisfied rather than full. Karen explains, This is likely to seem the cruelest rule to non-French readers. It certainly seemed cruel to me. Not feeding your children when they're hungry? Really? My first impulse was to cross out this rule and cancel the snack scheduling experiment. But I decided to hear him out. Of course I don't believe that children should be hungry, he started. And nobody else in France does either. I'm saying it's okay to feel hungry, he added. That way, kids get used to the feeling of an empty stomach, which is normal and healthy. On the other side of the coin from French rules, Linda Crawford takes a very freewheeling approach to food. On the How She Moms Facebook group, which you should totally join, by the way, she wrote, I have sensory issues where food is concerned, and so do at least one of my kids. I was raised by a dad who had to eat everything put in front of him and who did me the immense favor of abandoning that policy when it was his turn to parent. 
Food should not be a battle. Food is a pleasure and a necessity. It shouldn't be a tool or a source of esteem. If it is, it's truly at the parent's instigation, and it's usually just a control issue, not a health issue. Not always, but usually. At one point, all four of my kids were athletes, so we constantly had the talk about demanding so much from your body at the expense of refueling. My overarching mom goal is to help them be critical thinkers and decision makers. I've never had a locked pantry, told them they couldn't eat at certain times of the day, eat in certain rooms, wait for me to choose what they ate and when. These choices have always been theirs. And when they have a rough swim meet or a bad day of practice, they experience in a way they can understand the consequences of a day where all they consumed was lemonade and Doritos. They feel bad, they perform badly, they treat others badly. They have to learn over and over again, but don't we all? When they're feeling contentious and short-tempered, they either realize it themselves or are promptly told by their siblings, you need some protein and carbs now. The issue of how much to feed our kids gets even more complicated when body image issues come into play, especially as kids get older. We've gone through both extremes with a couple of our kids. You know, my, my dietitian ears like really perked up I, and it was a son, actually, ironically, which is not typical for eating disorders. But I just, I pulled him aside and we had just a frank conversation. And by this time he was 13 almost 14 and just had a very frank conversation with him about what, how do you feel about your body? Are you stressed? Do you feel like you're going to get fat? I've noticed this very open communication. So here's what I've noticed. What, how are you feeling? What's going on? And it did come out. He was deathly afraid of getting fat and this child was a rail at the time. still is. And I, I probably could do this because I am a dietitian and he knows that. So I could, I could just approach it very scientifically and say, here's the deal. Here's what's happening with your body right now. You're about to do a growth spurt. You, your body requires extra calories. And so I, I just, I approached it very scientifically that you're going to start losing your muscle if you do this and you need that extra energy. He's still very health conscious and I've, I've let him, I've let him just be health conscious. Like sometimes he will make his own meals and that's okay. And, but we just keep it on the table and talk openly about it. Are you feeling okay? Are you struggling? So much about it is, is beyond the food. So much about it is not a food issue. And when you make it a food issue, then you miss the opportunity to get into the issue. I have one right now that you know, we, we had the opposite of the eating disorder and another is bordering on the overeating and the mm-hmm. weight issues. And my husband and I just last week had a talk saying, is it to the point where you say something or not? And I refuse to have a child go through body image issues. Mm-hmm. I will not shame a child over their body, but I will do extra talks in Okay, let's let's find a healthy snack. Let's find Okay, is anybody munchy right now? Let's find a healthy snack. Getting just getting the information on the table and kind of brainstorm with everybody. What are what do you guys think are things we can do when we find ourselves in the kitchen and we're bored? You know, should we have carrot sticks out? Should we have oranges out? So it kind of becomes a group effort. It's not you do this and I've noticed you in the kitchen every 5 minutes. Food is complicated. We can follow general rules as we teach and model healthy habits, like teaching our kids about moderation and balance, teaching them how to follow satiety cues, talking about food in terms of health and not body image, and avoiding emotional eating. But most important is to create a positive culture about food. Less stress, more joy. Thank you for listening to the How She Moms podcast. To get links to all the resources I mention in each episode, including printables and worksheets when applicable, subscribe to my weekly email at howshemoms.com. It will also include news about upcoming episodes, workshops, and events, and lists of my favorite books, podcasts, and other things. I'd also love it if you'd join the How She Moms Facebook group, where we have great discussions about upcoming topics. And you can follow me at Instagram and on Pinterest at How She Moms. Share the podcast with your friends to help our community grow. Special thanks to my mom, Susan Singley, for recording the theme music to my podcast. She played this song often as I was growing up, and to me, it's part of the soundtrack of motherhood.